I'll be presenting the Neural Painter. I'm Ryan Ben Malik. I'm a PhD student at Cornell working on vision, language, and the intersection. Uh, I'm advised by Serge, who's an awesome professor in computer vision, in case none of you know. Uh, and I've been lucky to do research at a bunch of really great places over the past couple of years. Uh, so I'm going to focus on birds, and it's not just because they're pretty and there's a little bit of a wow factor there. It's mostly because there's a really nice benchmark data set for generation. Uh, and I'm going to propose a task, which is just a little bit interesting. I want to generate a photo of birds that have never been seen before I together in a picture because they're from all over the world. They're from different places. They look different, different climates. They would never appear together. I want to do this in a realistic fashion. I want it to look good. Uh, and our method can do that, right? Not only can our method do that, it can do it piece by piece in an iterative fashion. Uh, and this is where we start thinking about sort of interacting with computers in an interactive, conversational way, where you can update what you're trying to generate every time. Uh, we're trying to think of an entirely new way to design, prototype, make things. Um, but we end up running into a little bit of a problem, which is that we don't see intermediate supervision. Concretely, what this means is that we're never given examples of what a half-finished product should look like. Right? If we're trying to design a house uh, interactively for a customer, nobody tells us what a, ha a half-finished house looks like. We can't find pictures of half-finished birds. Uh, and we need a, a technical solution to bridge that gap. Um, and so we have one. Uh, it's in a paper that we submitted to a, a top conference recently. And if you're not familiar with the math, that's OK. Intuitively, we're, we're in the conditional GAN setting. And what's up top is the discriminator loss. And what we're trying to enforce is that at every point in the conversation, we maximize the probability of generating images that fit with the conversation so far and minimize the probability that, of generating those that don't. Right? Which, uh, and it turns out that because this loss is non-negative, we can do a couple math tricks, swap a couple expectations, collapse the last one. And it admits a really nice algorithm, which is sort of intuitively understood via picture. Uh, instead of doing the naive multi-step sampling where we'll assume that the final product is what we want in every stage, we just randomly pick a time point and say, this is our supervision for that. And that's mathematically equivalent to what we want. It's mathematically equivalent to us having that sort of intermediate product as data. Um, so here's some examples. Uh, they all look good, but I want to draw your attention to the one on the middle left, your left, not mine. Uh, the way to read it is that on the very far left is the, uh, the picture in the data set that matches the conditioning on the bottom. And right above each piece of conditioning is what our system generates when it receives it. So we say, I'd like a, a bird that's perching like, and it gives us a bird that's perching on a branch. And then I say, no, no, I want it to be blue. And it turns blue. And then I say, I, more than that, I'd like the bill color to be black. And it's black. Uh, so what is this useful for? Well, one concrete uh, industry is industrial design, right? Imagine being able to get a 3D model, something like a CAD design or a lamp, just from a conversation with the machine or just a, a description of what you want, right? Maybe we can democratize this in a way. Uh, another example is animation, right? And if you like the GIFs in the background, uh, it was made with Giphy, so that's just a little shout out. But this is a you know, this is an industry that's difficult, it's labor intensive, it's very, very low level. You note the amount of effort that's required just to get an eyebrow to raise. Uh, imagine being able to simply describe the animations you want with a series of emotions or something like that. Uh, and this is the part where I sort of have to come clean, I've been hiding something from you, which is that our model doesn't work for just images or birds or animation. It works in any case where we can find an example of a final product and a sequence of instructions or a history. And we're not limited in terms of type either. We can generate an image, we can generate audio, we can generate anything. And we can take as input language, audio, vectors, discrete options, uh, whatever you'd like. Uh, Really simply, we think that we can dramatically reduce the cost and the time and effort required to prototype and design anything for which we can find that sort of data. Uh, thanks. All right. Well done. Stay up here. You're going to answer some questions. Stay right there. Who wants to go first? Qu judges. And Eric. Yeah, so you, you mentioned, uh, sorry, <laughs> you mentioned a, a lot of examples in your presentation. Yes. Uh, which is the best one, in your opinion? I mean, I really like the birds because I've spent months staring at 
pictures of birds on end, but uh, as far as concrete things, I would say animation. Just because it's, it's a significant amount of effort and it's a really clean mapping. You can imagine just going through uh, animated movies, aligning them with the script, doing like simple sentiment analysis and saying, okay, when, it, when, when the character's happy, here's what should be showing up on the face. When they're sad, here's what should be happening. And it's very sort of natural in a creative way. Thank you. So uh, you are using generative techniques, and usually I think what you see sometimes is that you know they work in certain cases, and when they fail, they kind of fail sort of in a bad manner. So I'm just curious how robust something like this is, particularly when you say that it works across a range of domains. So, so, so it's true that you really need to tune it for each particular domain. Uh, it's just that the, the, the learning framework and the model is, is more general. Uh, I would say that it, it depends on the implementation, it depends on how much effort you're willing to put into it, and honestly, it depends on the size of the data. Um, Coco is far, far easier to train again for, despite the fact that it's way more complex, than Cub, because it's uh, 80,000 images versus 6K. And so, you know, one of them only took maybe a couple weeks of effort to get it working, the other one took months. Yes, Vierica. Um, how do you assess the quality of the generated images? Like to convince that you're much better than ba like the 10x compared to baselines? Um, so we, we don't really have a baseline to compare against in this task because nobody really does multi-turn generation. Uh, so it's, a, it's entirely qualitative at this point. Uh, the thing is, there, there's a number of metrics that exist for generation and for GAN generated images as well, but they're all sort of broken in their, in their own ways. And we did a little bit of testing, not, not completely rigorous, but um, they don't, they break, that's what I say. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank Is you. the GAN generation working well in those other domains you mentioned, like say uh, sound? Uh, sound? Did you mention sound or uh, uh, you mentioned audio I think is one of Yeah, the I mentioned things. audio as a possible output. So. You can generate audio really well, like if you listen to the Google Duplex thing, that's just a, uh, an ensemble of two models, Tacotron and WaveNet, and both of those independently generate really good output, and I, people have reproduced it, so it's not, it's not too difficult. And audio is a, is a good use case, especially because you can find lots and lots of data. Great, round of applause, thank you very much.